thank you for inviting me here. And um, so this talk is going to be in two parts. And the first part is about compaction. And I'm going to look at rapid compaction. This is something that in engineering is known as uh, dynamic compaction. The, the second part is what you do in the kitchen. You, you know, you want to put in some grains, you kind of slowly tap things out and let them settle. And that's the kind of quasi-static compaction that I'm going to talk about. So if I forget, you know, this part of the work was done by Akash Ghosh and Mahesh Pandi, who is in Weist. This part of the work was done with Akash, Dov Levin, Paul Chaikin, and uh, Jay Kumar. So, so dynamic compaction is something that is typically seen if you want to consolidate your base, you take up a and then you drop the load and that sets up a compaction uh, and typically what you do is you kind of make a grid because you see if it goes down the compaction is like this so you probably the next time you will compact somewhere here 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 and so on and so forth there's one kind of compaction that you come and this is practically used and we have all seen in some point of time when soil is compacted this is the way that the soil is compacted uh, there's a third kind of compaction, which is that you take some material up here in a jar and you kind of slightly tap it round about, huh? you shake it up. And typically in most of these measurements, you have a dimensionless quantity, which is acceleration that you put because of your uh, shaker that's there. These are all sinusoidally moving objects, so a good frequency and amplitude is given up here so that you get some acceleration term which comes from the product of the amplitude of the square of the frequency and then you have the g and you divide it out you get a dimensionless quantity which is gamma and you tend to measure you know how does a compaction happen so as a function of time things get more and more compacted and there is a little controversy about this is how does a compaction happen some people find that the compaction goes like the logarithmic law uh, while others find that it can go like an exponential thing and i think that it's just basically whether you're in weak confinement or a strong confinement. Let me just put in the numbers. D is basically your uh, dimension of your container. Small d is the dimension of your particles. Now you're dealing in experiments, so these are all more dispersed particles, and so you have just one single d in your system. If it's a lot of hundred, that people usually see exponential things. If they're a lot of ten, then people tend to look at logarithmic things, and you know, these are kind of things that they have done for all. For a large number of systems. If the system is polydispersed, you get a beta up here and things a little bit more messy. You can do it in compaction. Now the compaction in 2D is interesting because uh, typically in 2D, if you have monodispersed systems, they will form crystals. And um, so here you can, if you have thought about this problem, let me just go back once up here. And said, so suppose these were all uh, beads of same size if it was in 3D. The meaning of compaction would be that you know the thing that you would go is a random close packing. But if I wanted to compact it any further, then I would have to have little small packets of crystallites. Because if I can go to a crystallite somehow, and you don't ask me how, but if I make a crystallite somehow because of the surface, whatever it is because of, then that will cause be a volume fraction which is much higher than what you'd have what you have from a random packing, right? A random packing is something like sixty six percent to seventy four percent. For if you don't deal it with 2D, and if you and this is what will happen in 2D, if you try to put 2D same discs together, they will automatically go into a crystalline structure, and that's almost the maximally a compact structure that you can actually have, and it's very easy to go there. Uh, but nevertheless, as you put in the particles, because there's some rearrangement issues up there, there are little bit gaps in the system, and that's the gap that actually goes down while you're tapping the system. So while in 3D people don't talk about crystallinity. In 2D, there is a degree of crystallinity which also comes as you are compactifying system more and more. Uh, so I'll let me do this experiment. These experiments were basically done by taking some discs like this. I think these were discs and some people did with balls. Doesn't matter. You take a hammer, you tap it up here, the whole thing shakes up and slowly you get a crystal, which is even really a polycrystal. You can get green boundaries up here and how you pack. So this is n is equal to zero. The first First run, that means you have not, there is not, this is how you have prepared the system. 
in something like 65,000 is basically when you have done so many number of taps and, and then the system has gone from a high tier to there, basically means it has become more and more compact. Here's some two simple algorithms that people use. What they say is that, come on, let me put up, define a particle mobility, which defines as how much each particle is built by, up. so this is a displacement, it's not a, this is, sorry, this is a particle diameter. This is the dimension of the system. This is the particle mobility. And you associate the, the densification factor d rho by dn to be some factor proportional to the mu, the particle mobility of the system. And if you put back all of this together, uh, thinking that your know, mu is related to your density by some arrhenius kind of a relationship, you kind of get this particular functional form up here. So, you know, if you can put 3D piles of spheres, this is what I told you, this is semi-empirical uh, 3D piles of spheres again, depending upon what you have, the dimensions you can have, and the semi-empirical laws, which is basically, I think this is the long law, which I, somehow it's not coming here. Uh, if you have a 2D pile of disk, then it is kind of an exponential up here, uh, uh, exponential up here. This is the crystallization that you get because in, in 3D systems you don't get crystallization. In 2D it's easy to check out crystallization. I'm sure that you would hear there's a little bit of crystallization up here also. Uh, so you get mobility to go like this and things and so forth. So how do you compact systems? Well, there are two ways of compacting. If you shake them mindfully and you open up little gaps and within the gaps the particles tend to fall off. But if you are doing something like this, which is a dynamic compaction, you're going to bang against it, and then this is some, going to be some force change upon which the load is being transmitted from one point to the other point. And in likelihood that when the force is large, this particular chain is going to buckle, bend, whatever, do something. There's going to be some kind of a mechanical instability associated with this particular chain, force loading chain. And that will be what will lead to compaction. So we'll first look at the compaction, which is the simplest version of the compaction that you have. This is at the random loading. This is not, not, not tapping. Uh, what you have is you have something like this. Let's think of a chain of cylinders. You come up, you bang up here. You either can go out of plane in this particular way, sorry, in plane, but buckle some randomly in this direction. You can also do the classic Euler buckling, which means that I basically go out of plane. Now, so, what I'll show you is I'll do these experiments with little small stubs of cylinders. These cylinders are soft, they can deform. Uh, so, if you have rho less than rho c, so there is some critical density, and this is within a shear cell, I'm banging it from here. Initially, you have these lines that you can draw. As soon as you bang, you kind of get these, these uh, non affine deformations, and you can think that these non affine deformations are kind of shear banding zones. These are what are the mechanical instabilities that I was talking about. The interesting part actually goes, this is again rho greater than rho c, not rho less than rho c, is what happens is when you go below or above a particular transition. So if you are above this particular critical density of packing inside the system, what you land up getting is you, the system actually packs well, but now it kind of crumples out. The little space that you have between two cylinders, and you can, you can never have, like even if you're doing 2D, there's always a little space above it. And within that space, actually the particles tend to pop up and pop down, and that's how you get it. So you basically get a transition from something which is like an in-plane buckling to something which is like a popping transition. You know, the whole thing crumples out. It's a crumple zone that you get. And I'll, I'll illustrate how you get to this particular zone. You uh, can geometrically connect through this line. So that happened because you applied this shear or like it was the no it didn't happen because well, you applied the shear you, the moment I show you the movies it will be clear oh okay so if you started with a random you start with a random thing yes uh, this is just to motivate you know what you're going to get I'll come to the uh, oh. yeah okay. so what you start with is some random things up here uh, say this is n is equal to 1 this is what you are looking for Shan. Uh, and then you bang it for 500 times and you compactify here but you essentially don't see any out of plane motions. It's kind of compact, but it shows you that kind of uh, shear banding in the system. There's a small part, you don't see the shear banding. Uh, uh, there is, then you go to a higher density 0 0.87 and you bang it. And after 500 times, you basically see some state which is you know, a very crumpled up state. Uh, and even look at it that I've actually pointed something as red marks up here. So I will actually talk about rotations and rotations play a huge role in this. So we'll, we'll get into it, we'll come here. Okay, so 
we'll look at these questions of densification due to rapid loading, steady state configuration, what is the role of friction in the system? Obviously, friction will play a big role in our need and role of confinement. Now, uh, let's look at the experimental setup. This is a pretty simple experimental setup. What you have is, you have these um, uh, the studs. These are rubber cut out from rubber cylinders. Uh, the reason we did it was because we wanted to make, measure the internal stress on each particle, so the deformation should be able to be, should, we should be able to see them. Uh, uh, you have a pneumatic hammer. That's some hammer which goes up and bangs against this side. It moves, and if there is internal stress it's developed in my system, and if those particles wants to buckle up, they can buckle up. I'm holding the whole thing up with some top plate. And have springs on them to just hold them back. So basically, you can measure the normal stress also acting on it. It gives a little leeway, but it also allows you to, because if you don't have them, then all the particles will just, just fly off. Are you seeing that on the medium? Which stresses? The normal, the normal stress? Yes. Okay, so what you do is, you see there is a side camera up here. What you do is, you know the spring constants. You know all the spring constants up here. They're holding the thing down. Okay. You push against it. You know how much the displacement you've got. That's how you measure the normal force. Now, you could just ask me whether normal force and stress, well, a knife thing is just divided by the cross-section area. Otherwise, you can go up and find all the pop particles which are touching it, and then take that number. But oh, So that's how you the normal stress. Okay. So there is this experiment. What you do is you come with a pneumatic hammer up here. This is how I prepare my system. I, I bang the pneumatic hammer. It brings it to some place, you know, it just goes to some displacement, say theta max. And I choose theta max by, by putting a stopper up here so that it doesn't, by still putting a stopper up here so that the pneumatic shaft doesn't push any further. I withdraw my pneumatic shaft. Whatever will be the internal stresses in my system, if there are any, then they will relax and the things will come back. So theta relaxed it. I do this experiment again. I come and I bang it again. And I look at how theta r evolves as a function of time. Remember, for every bang, theta max is always constant. I always bring it to that particular state. I push it into that particular state. So what you can do is, you can start measuring first term that you can see is how this gamma n, and I'll tell you what gamma n is. Gamma n is theta r that you remember, that how much angle it has come back to, by theta r zero, which is that n is equal to zero. First time, how much it came back to, you divide this two up, and you start looking at them. It kind of gives you a stressed exponential decay in the system with a beta of 0.3, uh, you can do it as a function of density, and you basically get some kind of a dynamical transition in the system that at some point you get many more cycles before you actually go to a steady state. So at, at the steady state, at somewhere up here, you need many more cycles before the system can reach the steady state. What you can do now is, you can actually tune the relaxation time scale, which here is just a bang number that you have, and that you do by changing the friction in the system. And this is this we found was interesting. If you have a low friction system, this is mu is equal to 0 0.52, and I'll tell you how you get this, is that these are particles, and we coat them with a paint, very thin paint, which is, which is a Teflon kind of a paint, which gives them so that the particle-particle frictions are very low. So that's 0 0.57, you get something like this, which is the sharpest transition, and it's the lowest density that you have. You go up to 0 0.82, this is where we have non-coated particles. You don't have any coating on them. So this is rubber, rubber friction. This is zero, mu is equal to 0 0.8 to the transition point goes up here. And the other thing that you can do is you can make it to a high friction state. That is, you, you put a grid paper across it. So that's a very high friction system. And you see that what friction, and as I go up in friction, my transition is almost killed. Right? You, you can, so the exponents that don't change much well. You can, and this one, I don't even know whether there's an exponent or not, but but it kind of gets skilled, and the transition point actually also shifts from left to right. And that's not very surprising, because you see what, what the friction does it. The friction actually doesn't allow particles to move up. And this particular transition has to do with something where the particles are slightly going out of plane. If you prevent particles from out of going out of plane, you don't tend to see this particular transition. You can do the same thing uh, as a function of theta r. That is how much this relaxed back. And this is you, so this is the theta rs. So you go back and this is the theta rs. This is the base value to which it comes back to. And you can measure that. 
mu is equal to 0 0.5, so it again shows us price transition as a function of density. 0 0.82, it's already getting iffy, the transition. And I think 0 1.79, I won't even call this a transition up here. So friction kind of kills the transition. It's a stabilizing factor. I didn't actually tell you what the transition was, actually. I just I just said there is a transition. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just tell you what the transition was, and I kind of told earlier than this. The transition was this. So at some point, what you have is, as you bang, the, you see what will happen when you have a transition, when you have densification, you must be getting rid of the little void spaces, right? That's one way of getting rid of void space. The other way of going is, is by going out of place. Look at things. If I want to crumple it, if I allow some space up here, it will crumple and go there. So if the first transition, first phase, that means left of the transition is where only in-plane arrangements happen. The right of the transition is when particles tend to go slightly up and down. They kind of go up and down and they are, and that's in a very highly internally stressed out state. So you have a lot of stress being generated into the system. They don't relax in the state. This is because of particles, when they go up, they kind of get slightly tilted out and that's what they dig into the surface much more. So that's the transition. The transition is between whether particles pop out of plate or particles don't pop out of plate. Right. So just I'll interrupt for one second. So when you say bang, intuitively there feels like some elastodynamic uh, should be involved as well. So is there any wave effect or elastodynamic mediation of those transitions? So is there a dimensionless number or any quantification that uh, we can think what what role the friction plays and what role the elastodynamic plays, any competition? No, we haven't actually looked at it uh, because I'll tell you why it is it is, it is difficult. And at some point, I'll, I'll show that they, it's mainly mediated by rotations in the system. And I don't know how to handle rotations in this kind of a, you know, kind of the par individual particles can rotate and that plays a huge role in this transition. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so we said that you know that friction kind of stabilizes the whole thing. Uh, we could look at the densification, and well, what you can do is you can plot the density in the of the system, and as a function of n, and these are your saturated densities that is the maximum densities that you can you can actually push the system to. But what I did not tell you is what was this density that I was talking about when I plotted what was this density that I was talking about rho, and that density was, I should have said this, that if you go to this particular state, you know, when I band the system up, then in this particular state, what is the maximum, de what is the density of the particles? That is the density that I'm plotting. When I add particles, that's the density that I'm plotting on the x-axis. Remember, otherwise in the relapse state, the density is an evolving parameter. So there's no unique density for that. So when I plot something as a function of r, rho, this is the density that I, this is the, this is the maximum density the system can go to. So what you can do is you could actually go up and see this rho r as a function of n and uh, this kind of saturates to some different densities. And uh, these densities are basically the density in the relaxed out state. If you now use these densities on the x-axis instead of putting in the values of rho r's which I had, rho's which I had earlier. So remember these plots, instead of plotting it this particular way or this particular way where rho was defined as the density in the maximally compressed state, if I took my saturation density, then it kind of all of them kind of collapses that gives you a particular number. And this is about 0 0.85. So it means that, you know, the effect of friction is to prevent the system from going to that particular density, accessing that particular density. And that's how it happened. You could, this is two-dimensional system. You could look at defects in your system and quantify the defects. Well, at time, the defects actually also come down, the number of defects. This is the this is a fraction of defects that you have. Uh, and the time scale required to get these defects also has a divergence. So let me just tell you, these defects are basically how many are there six, and how many are there five and seven, and things like that. So there is also this other question about what about the local stresses in the system? you can quantify them in terms of the eccentricity in your system. So you can see that if I have, um, uh, if I have a highly compressed set, so this is 0 0.86, initial eccentricity is high, 
but it takes a long time to actually go down to some value, whether in, in, in its in its large and in limit, it's actually the centricity kind of has a finite value, but lower than what you started off with. Uh, so, uh, and then you can do it, it's the same thing, you can do it with with a lower density system. Similarly, the, the compression will also tell you that, you know, you come up here and you basically start to increase in your eccentricity, which tells you that there's a, the internal stresses are built up in a state once you cross into the compressed state. So let me tell you, let me show you the failure modes first. I've not talked to you, I talked about the failure modes at all. So uh, can I ask, sorry. Yeah, yeah so uh, is there a particular reason like why you don't fit the outer circle, uh, only the... When I said, well, it, the, the, uh, okay, there is no, no, we found it easier to fit the inner circles. Okay. I, because outer circles have two points touching, right? So your half transforms run into a problem. Uh, it's e much easier to do it with the inner circles. Um, if the outer circles do something else and across that boundary, if there is something else, we don't know. Then, yeah, so this is the experiment that you have, that you come, you bang. This is the very first time that you can bang the system. If it's lower than a critical density, if it's higher than a critical density, I don't know whether you noticed or not, but there is an overall buckling in the system. So it stops and it buckles, the system buckles. Okay. And uh, you can kind of quantify the system in a way that, well, this is my velocity of my plunger. Initially, the velocity just increases because it doesn't hit anything. And then the velocity decreases because I now start to get the resistance from my system. Up here, there's a rejuvenation. At some point, the system starts to provide me uh, uh, resistance. And this is where the post network chains start to fall. This is part of it. And once this pad is found, you can stop. It will slightly slow down. And then again, the velocity will fall off because then finally those chains will break. So here is the chains are breaking up here. And then again, the chains are forming. So this is this is the whole thing which you have the in-pain thing happening. You can see it for the other thing that you see it almost comes to a halt. It breaks and then goes up. So you basically have when you have, uh, when you have critical density, whenever the density is greater than a critical density, the speed, it kind of slowly goes up for a longer distance. So, you know, if you just even look at the plunger speed, it's very different when you have things below the critical density or above the critical density. It's much drawn out up here. How am I control? Is this a compressor? And I'm I'm more, I'm monitoring the compressor. There's a there's a pneumatic shaft coming in ba banging, so you have uh, you have uh, it's a pressure control. So pressure control and pressure is monitored. You can do a bit of laser scanning profilometry to figure out how many particles have popped up in the system. So if you are below a critical density, then for the first run, almost these are flat. But the moment you go below a critical density, you start getting that these things buckle out. And this is normal classical Euler buckling. You can measure this height. This is an average height of measured along this particular direction. Uh, you can see this as a function of this average uh, height as a function of density. If you're below a particular critical density, then it's flat. There is no out of plane buckling, then it starts to buckle. Uh, you change your you change your friction factor, you know, things don't buckle. You can go to very high density, that is initial high densities, but but with high friction, there's hardly any out of plane buckling. So the pearl buckling is being suppressed by adding friction in my system. So this is how I measure my top plate. This is how I measure the normal stress. As things puff out, this 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 springs get compressed. I know how much displacement I have here. I know what my uh, normal forces are. And, and this is what you do. You measure the normal force, again, the same thing. Below a critical density, the normal forces are, don't exist. After a critical density, you start, the normal forces start to come up as particles come up more. And what really happens is, as you cycle out the whole system, you saw that the system actually buckled out. And then as I relax band, this buckling would come down. And then again, some particles would buckle up, and then some particles would come down. But if you're out of the critical density, what happens is, some particles would tend on to come up, and they would get reinforced. So, Whatever buckled up, not all of them will come down. Some of them will come down, but not fully. 
and those particles are like the weak spots and they tend to get reinforced over and over again. Huh? So next time when I bang in, they will go up. So over time and so this is what will happen is you can go up and look at your uh, which are the buckle particles and you'll see that over time the number of buckle particles will start to increase. So this is a fraction of particles which are buckled and you see that below a critical density none of the particles are buckled. These are buckled, this is a popped out particle, sorry. This is, a, this, is, this is a structure, not the global buckling. This is incoherent uh, popping off of the particles. And as you cross the critical density, when you have reached a steady state, then the number of popped up particles increases in this particular way. And again, here you see the, what the role of friction is to not allow particles. Only very few particles pop out. Oh, this is like 1.2 cylinders. It's just a little gap. It's almost positive dimension in that sense that, you know, and... Uh, and this is this particular experiment, by the way, is known by you know any experimentalist who has worked on this system. There's nobody's followed it up, but because we don't want to have large friction, we always keep a little gap on the top. So in, in whenever we do experiments, never nothing is ex exactly two dimension. You really have that little gap on the top of this. So this is what we wanted to show you is this, you know, as you start pushing the particles, you see the particles which pop are also the particles which tend to rotate. So you pop up, you go up, it's a helical motion. So this is how you get to do this. You know, and come up, the next time you go up a little bit, next time you go up a little bit, next time you go up a little bit. So there's a lot of rotation in the system. So you suddenly start to the particles rotate and that's how they start to pop up. You can actually uh, measure the, quantify the fraction of the active particles. Active particles means how many particles have rotated and how many particles are not rotated. And you can quantify that and it also looks like a weekly but it looks like some something is happening at about the about the critical density up here. So now that I have told you about what how much minutes how many minutes for what? Twenty minutes, okay. That. So now that I have told you about what happens under rapid compaction, let me tell you something what happens under really I don't know if I shake them slightly. This is the this is where this is still you know, this Chicago group and others have done experiments. Take some greens and slightly shake them. I'll tell you what is the protocol of our shaking. And we'll do it in 2D. This is problem with 2D is, is that though we know that it is every 2D system is, you know, it's back at about 0.92 actually up here. It's a kissing problem that every uh, disk will actually touch six other disks in two dimension. Uh, but if you try to lay them down on a on a on a table, for example, you try doing this and somewhere down you make a mistake because, you know, there's friction and whatnot. And the problem is you will never be able to undo that mistake. Now, there's no grain. So it starts, of, so it starts spreading all over the system and you will see that lots, lots of errors that comes up here. This is what kills the, this is why you get polycrystal in, in your system. So there's a lot of polycrystalline domains in your system. And the question would be that I start with a system like that. And if I want to densify the system, I want to go to a system like that. And how do I go to this system? Right? So, so here is this, uh, the whole idea that I got, come with something, I start with like that. Lots of green boundaries. I basically want to a system which I define to say either has point defects or has no defects at all. Zero defects. Point defects are very difficult to get through, get out of the system. What do you do? Now, it turns out that uh, you know, people have looked at this problem at least in simulations, and uh, these are some random organization models where you put in some games where you say that, you know, I'll move the particles, I'll randomly move particles, and if, if there is an overlap, then I'll move these particles by some random directions. And uh, these are people who actually looked at it in 2020. This is slightly later than our paper was published anyway. Um, and they found that this is a fraction of uh, particles that, uh, that are active. And, uh, and they find that uh, this is also a dynamical phase transition with an exponent which is, says that fraction of uh, particles, as a function of uh, particles that are active goes with a factor of 0 0.42. Then uh, there's a time divergence in the system which has an exponent of 1.33, and this is the steady state value. This is this value that you know how many particles are active. Active particles means how many particles are actually moving. 
uh, at the end of it. And if nothing is moving, it's like this. It's, a, it's an absorbing state. So that exponent is 0.64, and F infinity means how many particles in the n is equal to infinite limit. Anyway, so typically for normal systems, this is a shear. Shear is air, con air conserving. If you do simulations, practically in experiments, it's not air con area conserving. So this is this is why we little have little gap on the top. This is our experiment that you have some. You use gravity up in your system. You kind of shake these things from the bottom by moving the linear stage. So think of these two arms as two pendulums, and they're just doing this in the system. So you start with the system up here. You go to that state, so that means you push the particles towards one side. You come back to again the initial state. You push it to the other side and come back and complete the cycle. That's what you do. And uh, I'm going to show you some strobed images. This is only strobed images. I start here. I go back here. Yeah, I could have taken strobe anywhere, but anyway, I'll just show you the strobe images for this. And this is for a particular critical density. This is what happens, and I'll show you. Then I'll tell you what happens at other densities. And if you're choosing the, you have, if you've chosen the right density, then you start with a random configuration, and slowly you annihilate out all the defects in your system, and you are left with one critic, one nice state in the system. Now, if you're worried about why these particles are hanging, there's an angle. This is critically chosen that the friction is just balances off there, but there are always some particles which tends to get stuck up there. So you could look at individual trajectories in the system and uh, these trajectories, they're not kind of universal, so there's no reason for the particles to have, like, go back in the same path. They come at some complicated paths. And uh, these are typical paths. This is on the left-hand side they made. This is on the right-hand side. They have some weird paths. Typically, this and that, left and the right side of the images, they are kind of symmetric. In the inside, there's some H-shaped object. So, so these are complicated trajectories that each particle does. But, but the interesting part of it is, they kind of come back to the same place. See, if you are in the steady state, if they, if they did not come back to the same state, then there wouldn't be a crystal. It would just have got defects all over the place, right? So you, this is a typical trajectory that I look at. It's gamma. Now it's not density. It's a, it's how much amplitude I'm giving to it. So if gamma is less than gamma C, you kind of have closed loop. Given thing, this is, you can doubt whether this is a limit cycle or not, but it's a closed loop kind of a thing. But if it's gamma greater than gamma C, then you basically have something which diffusing all over the place. This is this is certainly not the right parameter. I'll tell you even this is not the right parameter. The gamma is equal to gamma C is the right parameter. Oh, just now this now what I have in this system is I had this particular uh, and this is my system. I'm not changing the density because it doesn't make sense of changing the density. I can only change one parameter in my system is basically how much I'm disturbing the system. So that's why I'm doing this. In that other previous, the, the, the disturbance was kept constant and the density was changed. Here the density is kept constant, the disturbance and the, and the protocol is changed. So you could measure this is alpha S is the active particles, the end of the story. So active particles again is the particles which are moving. And you can see, you know, there is some time scale, how long it takes to actually get to a, to a steady state. There is a, there is a divergence, and this is again 0.75. This 0.75 was exactly what I had seen in the dynamical system also. The, this criteria was about 0.75 exponent. Uh, you can measure this, which is basically the absorbing state Fs, which is Ft for the, for the, for the theory calculations. And uh, this is the fraction of, of active particles in your system as a function of gamma. If you are below a critical point, then everything up here is absorbing. So essentially, you know, this value is zero. Once you cross it, it becomes like that. So here you get kind of these kinds of loops. This becomes, the loop becomes very tight. Sorry, this thing should have been a map here. Uh, once you cross over here, then it's very, very absorbed. It's very, very uh, chaotic. You could do the different density up here. There's a Voronoi uh, tessellation problem, but you could also do psi six and whatnot, everything, and uh, and essentially you could 
measure the defect density as a function of n again and you'll find that the defect density also comes down and that also has an exponent exponent that also has a power law character at about gamma c this is just to convince that you can do the size six parameter and that also has a peak out there so at this particular point so you can just look at maybe it should do this at this gamma is equal to 0.65 you actually have a monocrystal one single crystal if you're lower than that these fault planes are not not adult and you can think about it i'm and look at this gamma this is really tiny gamma i'm really really moving little small parts actually it's not not really exploring much uh, if you are at very large gammas then obviously you get lots of defects in your system uh, if you change the size of the system so you can go from uh, say some of them i did seven this is uh, eight and this is nine probably and you see that this will actually start to shift this is the defects that you have it goes to zero here this also goes to zero but the point is how this is shifted this is shifted from here to there you can measure the gamma c as a function of d and it looks like that the critical strain actually has a linear relationship with the d and it could push this thing much further because then you started getting other kinds of effects in your system because we get very tiny particles they don't remain two dimensional they tend to buckle out of plane so this is the question that pinaki was asking the effect of gravity and pressure so if you did this whole thing and if you said that you know when i get to a when i said that you know i have got to a state which is non absorbing what part of it is non absorbing so if you do this system you'll find that this is the trajectory of some of the trajectories you'll find that there is the slower path so this is remember the gravity this is this is the gravity is in this direction this is lower part of the system where the things are always absorbing is the top part the melting is always happening from the top part so if i had applied a pressure on the top part i can actually suppress this entire melting phenomenon up here so if you're in an absorbing state then this particular parameter l is zero which would mean that if i look at these trajectories there you can see all of them are beautiful trajectories they're all forcing up to each other and that's what you have in your system if i'm diffusing then l is greater than zero that's the l that i'm talking about and you see the top part has kind of diffused the bottom part is not diffused at all and you can measure that l as a function of gamma in the absorbing state l is equal to zero this is what i said that all particles come back to its own position if an active particle then it's kind of goes up in this particular direction so linear whatever you, i don't know what it is it's some function out there uh you could just estimate an order of magnitude calculation saying there is a normal stress in the system and the first layer has to melt before the gamma c can happen and you can balance this too so this is the sigma z which is the strain value and g which is the elastic constant which balances the rho gl term in your system and that gives you a gamma c in your system so that you see is the gamma c goes like linear but that's a hand waving argument of brain so uh what about rotation in this system we didn't get some great physics about the rotation except that we realized that not all the particles tend to come back to its own position i mean almost nothing comes back to its position so if you were so in the even in the absorbing state if i were to track the the angular position of the particle they don't come back to its position it's only the center of masses which come back to its own position and i think it's trivial to understand why because if i'm pushing this particles up here then this two walls are not the same because this is not a continuous fluid right so this wall is a pusher this wall is a puller you can't really pull on granular systems so they are just confining rotations happen here and translations happen to particles which are on this side of the wall so i rotate i go this side when i do this side this particles rotate but this particles translate so we tend to build up rotations overall in the system uh you can do the bidispersal system in your system and uh, well it just shows you similar kind of behavior except that the exponent so let's look at the exponent so random organization exponents were about 1.33 for relaxation time f infinity was like alpha so that's goes like beta was 0.64 this term is kind of 0.8 0.64 you know this is a plus minus about 0.2 so this could match up the f infinity parameter this somehow for a mono dispersed system is 0.75 by dispersed system and uh, random organization have the similar kind of numbers this is 1.33 that's 1.3 but the mono dispersed system seems to be very very different so number of 0.75 This is also the number that we got get from the 
uh, random uh, uh, dynamical uh, compaction. There also we get at 0.75. I have a feeling that with with world dispersed systems, there is a lot of buckling and things like that going out in the system, and uh, that could be one reason why why these numbers are different. So they look like border dispersed and the dynamical dynamical compaction are similar kind of problems, while it's random organization by dispersed are, like, are similar kind of things. Yeah. So we have two dynamical transitions in the system. One that came from uh, uh, thus where you have a highly ordered state in, happening in your system. The other was a reactive to an absorbing transition. Uh, are these two transitions coupled? Are they connected to each other? I don't know. Is it serendipitous that they happen at the same point? I don't, I'm not sure about it, but that's where the, uh, our results are. Thank you. Yeah, uh, fascinating talk. And it was, I mean, the illustrations were really, I mean, um, provokes questions and interesting uh, comments as well. So uh, again, uh, when you say mu's, uh, those are friction coefficients, right? Yeah. And you have three different values and 1.67 as well. Yeah. So it's friction between who? Two oh, cylinders. This is the experiment. I'll tell you how do we measure the friction. Actually, friction here is also not an easy way of measuring it out. Uh, this is friction between the two cylinders. Uh, that's what we have changed. But you could ask what friction is this? Um, because it could happen that, you know, it's rolling or... So this is the experiment that I... This is how I measure the mu. So what you have is the three... The, similarly, three cylinders up here. Okay, that's... The, the inner cylinder is the one which I want to measure the friction of. These three cylinders have all have the same kind of coatings on them. I put a load up here and see when it starts to rotate. So in some sense, I'm seeing a rotational uh, friction in the eye system. You know, it's a... It's a Rotational sliding. It's, it's, it's a, I don't know what friction am I seeing, but it's a friction between the particles. Okay, so there is no rate effect or anything other effects within that. Why do you do the averaging or something? So these are extremely slow experiments. I'll tell you for these experiments. Well, these experiments are not slow because you know you're bad. Yes, and so these there would be a lot of uh, time dependent phenomena in it, and I wouldn't be very surprised if there aren't any. Uh, unfortunately, we have not got to another material. We would have loved to get to another material, which we could do it. But you see, the thing is that we don't want things to topple around and all. Those are practical problems. But we haven't got another material. So there could be time-dependent effects in it. I would not, I would be very surprised if there is no time-dependent effect. And again, this is for my own takeaway home messages. So why, when you say buckling, so, uh, I mean, that is generally uh, when we do a uh, very slow loading and then at one point there is a bifurcation. My, uh, uh, so intuitively, why it seems counterintuitive in a sense, it may be just one, uh, again, back in, back to the same point, there is a wave which, uh, which doesn't get enough time to fall back because of the friction. Yeah. So are they two so things? You're saying rightly, right? You're saying that, you know, you have, you, because you have a time dependent forcing term in my system, my Euler buckling equation, the Euler buckling, it doesn't give me that solution which is this one one particular. It has it is a combination of all kinds of modes in my system. So why do I get one? It could be what I call as the Euler is that you see what happens is it stops. Yeah. So the loading stops and then it starts to push. Yeah. So what I fail to get uh, take away uh, is that instead of it, it's a buckling, it may be there's inertia effect involved of the individual masses and hence it is elastrodynamic or wave mediated things rather than just uh, so in what way I'm incorrect here that's what I want. Well, I don't know whether you're incorrect or not. I said buckling in a in a sense that uh, that it looked like a buckled structure so it was more like a to explain the whole thing it was a story it wasn't really I was not saying that this is the Euler buckling limit I was not saying this is the static Euler buckling statement I was not making that sense. it just looked buckled I said buckled okay okay yeah Thanks. Yeah. How does that influence the packing? Uh, no, so what meaning basically? So what really happens is, what you get is you start to get so these. It's okay. So typically, what happens is if I'm doing this, this, uh, if I'm putting a force and I'm putting an acceleration. Then you have a mass matrix in the system that connects the two. Now, every time about this axis when I'm loading it up, this this particles tend to splay around a bit, and as this splay 
then the force now has a component which gets it digs them into the substrate. Now the frictional component, so what is preventing them from going back? Why is it like, you know, I'm, I'm being held at a much more compression? It's because friction is now much higher, it plays much more higher. Because the orientation of the particle, the way it's touching the plate is has altered. So typically in the first low density system, I was coming in, you know, all these particles were flat on my system and I was just doing this. So, you know, friction didn't change. But now these particles have got a little bit of splay in the whole system. And that allows the system to actually support, finally, it has to be a force balance. The force is coming at both the top plate and from the bottom plate. My question was more related to uh, how the properties of the frictional interface evolve. Uh, as you hit, hit them multiple times, because each time there's a loading so what we do is, real for each particle. So what we do is, typically we repeat these experiments over and over again, without changing the particles themselves. And then the results don't change much. So I would say that overall, if you say fatigue of the particles, if that's what is that I'm pushing in, you know, I maybe I'm scratching the surface, maybe the particles are getting, because after all, these are rubber, right? You print rubber. I, you know, I think debuted in rubber. So uh, I think those, whether those matter or not, over the scale of which we have done experiments that, you know, 50 recycles for each experiment, they haven't changed. Sorry. In one of your slides, yeah. uh, you, you showed that it is strained. Huh? Uh, the, there's a development of um, voids of fracture. You mentioned that. Okay, so was it this? Uh, well, no, not really. Uh, before that, maybe. No, this is the, before that. Before this? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, well, no. Yes, yes. Oh, this yes. one, ah, I know this. Right. This one, the tear that you have. How do you... you the know, little yeah. tear up here. Exactly. How, I don't how do you know that? I mean, I don't know. I don't the, understand. But yeah. So there is some load bearing structures, and those load bearing structures playing out. Yeah, I, I really I can you know, get that I, in the feeling, but yeah, I don't. If I have to, no, I don't. Want it, I don't know. Yeah. It looks as if there's two arms. So the way I would have thought about it is there are two load bearing arms. You're pushing on the two load bearing arms, and they're kind of bending around. That's how I would think about it. Because this is another highly the, at this point, when it's playing, it's, it's actually highly compressed. These lines are very compressed. It's a low, it's a low bearing structures. We tried doing it with friction. I thought that friction would do that. Uh, when friction just killed everything. Yeah, and that is true. That is true. I, we didn't do it. We didn't put in a thing. Yeah, we didn't put that in. When we started the experiment, we thought that what we were doing is somehow, you know, I might have addition and friction in a similar way. This is why I did it. Yeah, I could, could have coped. Yeah, I could have done that. Yeah, some sticky polymer probably. Yeah, I have not done that. Yes, yes, this is from Yeah. Thank you. In the second case, uh, how does friction play a role? Uh, how does it delays the leaning or something? Okay, so in the second case, we haven't found the role of friction at all in my systems. You know, we have tried playing around it. So, okay, what really happens is, okay, I'll give you the... the so if you look at these loops, the only role that friction plays here is if you look at these loops, these loops are not really great, these ones, because they don't come back exactly to the same point. What we did then was we couldn't change the friction. It's not easy to change the friction. We put in a lot of ultrasonic speakers on your glass bead so that they, they kind of shake the whole thing up. This is called as vibration induced lubrication, you know, because you're doing that, your substrate interactions have gone down. These loops become very tight. The transition becomes much more cleaner. Beyond that, we haven't seen any other effect. And what material these beads were? Uh, this is this is laser cut with uh, these are these are poly uh, acrylic. These are acrylic tests. So for the active absorbing transition, is this university class known, or is it sufficiently distinct from everything there? It is distinct, because if I have yeah, caught something which is very different, 1.3 minus 1.3 is what people have seen in, in random organization, but we get some very different number, it's 0.75, that, that I don't know why. I don't think that there is, there is anybody who has reported that number. Also, it changes within the same dimension. It is yeah. So when you're showing these loops, this is uh, the actual position or is it? many shells. Okay, so it's not the non-affine deformation, it's just... No, 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 it's actual positions. Okay. So 
But what do you think this will, how this will translate to non-affine deformation? You can actually look at these, I'll show you. Oh, non-affine deformations, well, that, yeah, uh, I don't have it here. They're very complicated structures that happens, but I, I don't have it there. This is a, you're wanting the one for which we, there's, a rap, there's a very rapid uh, loading of the system. Because I, I guess the shape has to do probably in the position of the part. Yeah, so if you look right. at it, and this is, maybe I can give you an quick answer to this. Oh, okay. oh sorry, okay. yeah, here it is. You look at this part. This is over the endetic, and I'm not pointing all of them. I'm pointing some other. Be very crowded. So these ones are like you know less loopy. That means the the bolts are less. And this is moving the maximum because that's the bottom plate. This is moving, so that's why the loop is extended up here. These ones are like more loopy up here. The ones at the boundaries are loopy, and this is also because these are rotating particles. All these particles are mainly rotating. Anything which rotates actually gives you more more loopy kind of structure.